for in a um, basic science research lab where he was doing basic science research. Basically, I can't even remember on what. Um, but he um, has a PhD in cell biology, in molecular biology, and was doing bench work research um, in diabetes, kidney disease, and other things. And during that time, he was a lecturer uh, at the medical school. He was um, in the Department of Nephrology for a period of time. And then he um, got his, uh, M his MPH, MPH. Um, and he's been doing not only mentoring students in all breadths of research from basic science to community outreach, is also doing significant community outreach um, as it relates to kidney health, uh, particularly in diabetes, and has done a significant amount of work in Zuni. Um, and from my experience in going with him to Zuni, is well loved by everyone there. Um, and he is going to tell us about a project that he did today with um, some of the kids in Zuni around obesity. And um, I want to thank him for um, coming to do this, and hopefully um, we can hear more from him in the future. So thank you, Dr. Shah. Well, you can all call me Raj. I mean, uh, I want to be at your level to explain to you what I have done so far in Zuni as a template and see if we can have this model to other communities around New Mexico because I love New Mexico. I'm here for 30 years now, uh, transplanted from India in 1983. And uh, it was like a, really something which I didn't even thought about staying here in America. Um, I was just visiting here my brother for Disneyland <laughs> and he took me there and then he told me at that time, well, you have done your PhD, why don't you stay here and work? Uh, I didn't want to stay here because I was the last kid in my family attached to my mom and she was like, no, you are not going to, I mean, I have all my kids slapped me and, you know, you stay with me. And so I went back. But then I came back here with the opportunity with National Institute of Health but I did my postdoctorate. And the postdoctorate was in completely different arena. It was in cancer. And I have no idea how did I transplant from cancer into metabolic diseases, you know. Um, but it's long story short, you know, what I'm trying to tell you here is that I love New Mexico, I love the Chile here, and I love my Native American communities here in New Mexico, okay? So that's my disclosure that, you know, I love New Mexico. I'm a New Mexican. I'm as much as Native American or Hispanic you want to call or a white person. Okay? Um, so do I have to go through all this? Uh, no. no. Well, we just remind, and Kevin did remind, so just reminding you to um, star pound if to unmute your phones or mute. And as Kevin said, if you're making too much noise, he'll mute you for, your, for you. Um, so the next slide just reminds our, um, you've already made your disclosure statement. Uh, next two slides remind us that for providers who present patients for either Molina or Blue Cross Blue Shield, they do reimburse um, for that consultation. So if you have patients, uh, we would love to hear about them and there's some incentive for you being here. And we've already done roll call, which is your next slide. So next. Yep. All right, so my goal today uh, and the objectives I have is to not really scare you with the epidemiologic data, you know, but I want to describe to you to see, you know, think about epidemics or pandemics or whatever you want to call in terms of obesity. And then I'll also give you some of the risk factors and economic impact, you know, this will lead us to. And then talk to you about some of the results I got from Zuni Children's. So I listened to two of you who are from Zuni, so uh, I'm happy that you are going to listen to me uh, about some of the data which we got from Zuni school children's, okay? So the thing worries me about obesity is not directly for obesity, but I'm worried about diabetes. 
So if you look at the current data from CDC, uh, which tells us that you know 27 million Americans are who are diabetic, but you have 79 million Americans, which is more than one third of U.S. population, which is pre-diabetic. And those people who are pre-diabetic, if you look into them, they're basically obese. And so, you know, we worry about all those things right now about Obamacare and whether we can cover everybody or not. Um, but every year, those, you know, people who are pre-diabetic, 10% of them will move towards diabetes. And the cost for diabetes is so much that, you know, worrying about covering everybody now in 10 years, I don't know whether we'll have any healthcare coverage for covering things with diabetes. Actually, it's really scary. I got a news yesterday, which I think I forwarded to Kathleen. You know, in previous presentation, I should say that every 15 seconds, somebody dies in the world because something to do with diabetes. And now that came down to six seconds. So, I mean, uh, this is a really troubling thing. And when I say nature versus nurture, that's the obesity, you know, which, you know, kind of help you understand that the eventuality of obesity is one of the things is diabetes. So, I don't know how many of you have seen this typical clinical picture in a man or a woman, you can say, but mainly in man, uh, you know, behind that neck. Have you, I don't know, is there a way we can also communicate with them? Yeah. Okay. They can just you ask so, the question, they answer. So they have the PowerPoint. <laughs> okay. And um, you can describe anything, but you can also ask questions, and then they have to unmute okay. their phones to um, okay. communicate back. So one thing that's helpful is, is looking at the second hand. Give people about 40 to 60 seconds if you answer ask a question because of the delay. Okay. So my question is, you know, has anybody seen this kind of picture in your children who are obese? Yes, I have in Zuni. Okay, and so what do you think about it then? I try to zero in on those kids and call them in in the middle of the school year for some one-on-one. -on -one. Uh -huh. But mostly we're doing um, general education to everybody. Okay. So do you then have a way to talk to them about having this, you know, obese kid, you know, is major risk factor for having a diabetes? I usually talk about just diet and exercise, just really general. Okay. Okay, so this is a typical scenario which you will see it in New Mexico because this is very prevalent. The condition is called, you know, uh, what is it? Acanthosis. Acanthosis nigrans. Um, nigrans is the word came out from, you know, it's not a Greek dictionary word, you know, but it talks about, you know, Niger, Niger, meaning, you know, African American. So black color, if you see it, you know, and it's a thickened skin. So, uh, that's actually the typical scenario you'll see in young children who are obese. The picture you have down under, which is what a lot of people have tried to understand obesity, and one of the things is about genetics, where you know, on your right hand side, the one mouse, which is so heavy compared to two others, that's genetically created. And so, once we create something like that, we want to understand the pathophysiology of it and how can then we look at the inner of uh, the obese you know, condition, okay? So to define your obesity, uh, people who are worried about obesity is intra-abdominal, which is the visceral obesity, which you see it in your front, not in your back. Um, which is a very much, you know, uh, kind of thing involved in cardiovascular risk. Insulin resistance, which is diabetes, type 2 diabetes, uh, dyslipidemia, and inflammation and thrombosis. So these are the major things you will see in obese people, okay? The useful indicator for visceral fat is the waist circumference. So when you do children's and look at their height and weight and say, 
I'm going to look at BMI. Uh, instead, if you have waist circumference, then that's more kind of predictive about whether you can classify somebody with overweight or obese, obese condition. Uh, the other thing which I have used is called BIA, uh, bioelectrical impedance, uh, which is a small instrument. You can hook it up to the patient or the children, and you can actually, uh, I mean, it's a very minute current passed through the body, and it will tell you really exactly the fat content in the body and also the obesity. Some of the data is about global uh, prevalence of obesity. Uh, this slide is from 1994, where America was number four in the world with obesity, both men and women, okay? Compared to China, Japan, Brazil, um, Australia, Netherlands, Canada, and all. But if you look at 10 years down the road, on your side, USA is 31%. That's that little sticker there, right? Actually, that was in 2008 and 10. If you look at 2012, the CDC suggests we are 36% obese in America. Okay? If you look at this slide and county level estimate of obesity between 2004 and 8, look at all the counties, the more red meaning more obese and obese people in that county. So if you look at our typical New Mexico, that four corner area, you know, uh, where my Zuni is also. So uh, we have had a lot of obesity. Now, if I have to put this picture along with another picture where I say, you know, sedentary life or people who are not really active, then you can look at this. This is a county level estimate laser time physical inactivity. It's not physical activity, it's inactivity. And look at those areas where you saw the obesity completely superimposed with physical inactivity, right? Now, based on this, the jump, which is to diabetes. Look at the county level diabetes with that and where you see the highest diabetes. Does this make sense to you guys? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so basically, if you look at diabetes rate here in this slide, which is more than 11%, in some of the communities, in like Native American communities, it's more than 17 to 18%. In Zuni, what we found is more than 32%. Right. And so, you know, I'm in Zuni for 15 years and trying to help the community to see, you know, how can we reduce the burden so... I'm now focusing towards early childhood obesity and other conditions, okay? So, it's a common childhood condition. Uh, if you look at age 6 to 11, we have gone from 4% to 23% now. This is now overall in America, okay? And age 12 to 19, we've gone from 5% to 24%. If you are obese at six year old, then your chance of lifelong obesity is 50%. That's really, you need to think about it. If you are obese at age 13, then your chance to keep it is 75%. And if you compare this in terms of ethnicity, black and Native Americans, age six to nine, are 50% more likely to be obese than white and also Hispanics. Okay. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, and this can be in general. Has anybody looked at those who, kids who are obese but then are not obese as adults? And what's different about them? Yes. So when we define obesity, we look at this physical structure, height, weight, or waist circumference. But there is a word called metabolic obesity. So metabolic obesity, you know, you can be heavier, but you may not have real physiological obesity, which is called sarcopenic obesity, where a person can be lean body mass. But if you measure some of the markers, they are really obese. And so uh, when you say obesity based on only BMI, 
That's why I don't go for that. You know, that's why I do BIA, to look at their fat content, you know, which will tell me whether they are really obese, obese or not. So to answer to your question, yes, a lot of kids who are, you know, kind of using this classification of uh, childhood obesity uh, at 98 percentile or 95 percentile level, that's basically height and weight mm -hmm. and weight circumference. Uh, but, you know, what we have done, and that's what I'm going to show it to you in my Zuni study, is that we have looked at fat content also. So if you see somebody heavier, I mean, I don't know whether my tummy, I can... Don't show us your you, tummy. You know, but I'm not, <laughs> I'm not obese, obese, you know, but if I look at my BMI, is at 26, so I'm kind of overweight, okay? But metabolically, I'm not obese because I have checked my physiological <laughs> parameters, okay? Some people weigh themselves every day. Raj checks right. his metabolic parameters. <laughs> yeah, because I have access to all that. <laughs> okay. Now, this is a very important slide. And it says, you know, obesity loves inequity. <laughs> so if you look at our socioeconomics, if you look at our educational system and all, so if you are poor, you are more obese. If you don't have education, then you are obese. So look at this data. BMI of more than 25 or 30 or 40 in blacks is 60% to 29% in obese. And that's different in male and female. But look at Native Americans. It's 29% same as African Americans, but 74% are overweight. Okay? And compared to white, is 68% and 28% obese, okay? But if you look at the education level, people who are obese are in the group where there is no education, you know? So uh, only 16% are obese who has a college level education. So what does this tell you? That if you educate people or if they go through some kind of didactic education, in school or you know, on their own, uh, I think that will help to understand the different things about lifestyle. And that can actually dictate whether you are going to be obese or not. Look at the diabetes also in there. If you are having college level education, you are not going to see so much diabetes in there. 6% versus 13%. So this slide is from uh, is looking at the prevalence during 98 to 2003 and 2003 to 2008 among you know Head Start basically age two to four by race and ethnicity, and different lines are the prevalence in different ethnicities. So total is the um, uh, you know line which is blue hard line, and if you look at from 98 to 2008, we are now flattening out. But look at the top line where the yellow arrow is. That's our Native Americans. Where the early childhood obesity in two to four, you know, is still going up. If you compare that to other ethnicities, it's kind of tapering down or coming down. So we need to address this issue in Native Americans. Okay? So why this epidemic? One of the things which is no the kind of thing, which is physical inactivity, right? 60 to 85 percent of adults are not active enough to maintain their health. And I think we need to do this. We need to work with them. We need to give them everything they needed in terms of the resources and make sure that they do physically keep themselves active. The other one is high, diet, high calorie and fat. I mean, if you look at our school children, you know, and all the schools across New Mexico, they still have throw up machines in their school uh, because those Pepsi and Coca-Cola can give some funds which can be used for buying books and all, you know, and there is nothing we can do about it because, uh, you know, our schools are not well supported. 
So that's one of the things that our kids are exposed to, you know, high sugar kind of drinks and the food is also in high calorie. For general population, we are aging population and a lot of urbanization happening from agriculture to urban lifestyle. When I first came here in Albuquerque, we didn't have that many Native Americans around in Albuquerque, suburban Native Americans. Now we have more than 50,000 Native Americans living in and around Albuquerque. Look at this. You know, the typical way my mom used to feed the siblings, we were five siblings, <laughs> was to give the food and she was then top of us, meaning we finish our plate. <laughs> But now, look at this. We have given the kids, you know, their TV in front of them <laughs> while they are eating. So, it's like we are hanging these puppies, you know, in front of something where they can watch and eat. That's wrong. Look at this is one of the fitness centers in Albuquerque, <laughs> where you have stairs to go up. But there is an escalator. I have no idea how the city approved it to keep an escalator at the fitness center. <laughs> and the people are going through fitness center, I mean the escalator, instead of going to the stairs. <laughs> More importantly, they're using it. The other thing we've seen is supersizing everything, right? From the burger, look at the calories, 202 to 310. The french fries, 210 to 610. Our candy's gone bigger, our soda pop's gone bigger, and the thing which we do in cinema hall is gone up here, right? And this, you know, popcorns are silly things, you know, because you can refill it every time, any, yeah. as much as you want. At the movie theater? Yeah. Yes. For free? Yeah. Yes. You buy the if you buy that bigger oh, re container. Oh, really? Yes. Didn't know. And that's fine if you have a family of ten. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but if it's just the two of you... So a lot of or four of you, even. Yeah. <laughs> so now if you look at this, you know, we evolved from that monkey, you know, stupid monkey we call. And look at, you know, it took us millions of years from monkey to stand on our feet. But then we dropped ourselves and it took us 30 years to become that obese. I mean, it doesn't make sense, you know. So what are the problems you can get from obesity, which everybody knows about it, right? High blood pressure, high cholesterol, and getting cardiovascular disease. You have impaired glucose tolerance, you get type 2 diabetes. You have breathing problems, such as sleep apnea and asthma. You have joint problems and musculoskeletal discomfort. You'll get fatty liver disease, gallstones, gastroesophageal reflux, which is heartburn. I mean, I can get heartburn because I'm stressed. But you can see 11-year-old complaining about girl, which is the upper reflex, acidity problem. That's not good. Obese children and adolescents have a greater risk of social and psychological problems also. Like they feel like they are discriminated. They have poor self-esteem and it can continue into adulthood. These are something which doesn't need medication. These are the problems we can solve if we change our lifestyle. Now, I wanted to show some of the data from Juni School District. And, you know, these are from 2006 to 2009. And I'm thankful to this woman, E.J. Uh, e. Charles, who gave me this data three years ago and said, can you help us look at this and understand better so we can work with kids in terms of their lifestyle and nutrition. So in 2006, 27% were obese and it stayed in 27 to 32%, right? But look at the overweight, gone up from 13 to 17%. And so if you total them, Right? So it's about, you know, 40 to 50 percent of overweight and obese. But now, if you look at 2012, 
72% of Zuni school kids are either overweight or obese. This is another school in Zuni. Same thing. You know, a lot of them are overweight and obese. So, in 2010, when Obama came up with this idea about stimulus package, and he said, Sawal Ready Projects. And I said, okay, I have the patient population. I have my governor who is interested in reducing the obesity. So I got funding from them. And we kind of struggled to find a building which we renovated using $100,000 from federal government and make this beautiful exercise facility right next door to IHS. These are some of the people who came during the inauguration of the facility. Um, We're so happy to see the Envision posters in your, <laughs> in your pictures. They're right here on the wall. Thank you so oh, much. How'd you Photoshop those in so quickly? Uh, yeah, that that was really good. We got at that time. No. Uh, yeah, Sanjeev gave us that. But Jane gave them to Sanjeev. Right. <laughs> so the exercise facility is so beautiful where well, we have... Uh, different ways of doing things. So this is a program which we did in Zuni Pablo uh, for children. Yes. You know, I just realized you're probably screaming when you get that thing. Did you have a question? Oh, okay. So the way we bring the children to the exercise thing is that we pick them up from school after their school and we recruiting like 25 students at a time and they have to spend six months with us. Regular exercise three times a week for one hour. It's not only that. The matrix actually is so intricate because we work with their family members also. And we look at their uh, you know, family where how much diabetes in that family is, how many people are obese, what is the income level, and we collect all those information. And we try to design things in terms of obesity intervention. Because if you address children in school only, that's not going to work. Because they go home after the school. And then is their home. So that environment if you don't consider in your intervention panel, then that's not good. Okay? So we bring kids and we do this 10-minute warm-up exercise where they go through flexibility, standing low-level exercise, so slowly increase the movement and warm up for exercise session. And this, there are three stations we have. One is called cardiovascular exercise station where they can use recumbent bike, treadmills, elliptical trainers, strap climbers, which increase their heart rate and aerobic capacity and caloric expenditure. There are resistant training activities, which utilizes free weights, weight equipment, body resistance, and they can tone, actually, because we use kettlebells. You know, I think you have seen in that previous picture. Um, and then variety of choices to keep activity fun and engaging. Yeah we reduce the calorie, okay? The activity they choose are from spinning class to agility to balance. We take them running out. We walk them. We take them for basketball, football, jump rope, and group fitness classes. We have now V games where we project it on the screen and they can play V games because that's the new trend now. If you want to engage kids, uh, we game is the another easy way, okay? And the final five minutes are used for cool down and stretching and exercise. So this is a typical exercise protocol. You can see it anywhere, right? But what we do for our children, uh, when they come first time, we do their measurements because having my background now in epidemiology, I like to measure everything because I look at outcomes, right? So when they come, we do their complete BMI, uh, height, weight, weight circumference, and also we have 
um, BIA instrument where we can look at their body fat and all. We have survey instrument which we administer to them where it's a simple demographics to some disease condition if they have, but we collect their family information also. We have 24-hour nutritional recall, which they have to fill out. And then we collect the blood and send it off for clinical phenotyping, meaning we measure their lipid panel, we measure their inflammatory markers, we look at their hemoglobin A1C, we look at their glucose and all those. It's a nice thing, okay? Because that can tell me whether I'm having any impact in terms of improving those things, right? Okay, now this is the data from the first batch which we finished with 50 students, okay? Like I said, you know, we recruited people from 12 years to 17 years. Height, weight, you're not going to see so much change in height and weight. A weight maybe a little bit. Look at the BMI from baseline to three months to six months. But the things under BMI is very important. The fat percent really decreased. At the same time, free fat mass gone up. That's what you want in your kids or in any obesity intervention, whether it's kids or adult. Then if, I mean, the other parameters like total body weight and extracellular water component or intercellular water component, they are just for me to understand where the shift is happening. Okay. This is very good results where now I have uh, I met now my 90 students, okay? Uh, I didn't have a chance to include the other 40 into this data. But I think there is a trend and I'll have the data, you know, pretty soon for that also. This is the important thing. This is what I look at, which is, did we improve on their clinical phenotype? Not so much changes. Um, from glucose to, you know, things, but look at A1C, 5.9 to 5.7 to 5.5. HDL, LDL, LDH. I do LDH because, you know, when you have muscle breakdown, you know, that reflects, uh, you know, some of the stuff, whether it's because of the exercise or because you have some other muscle uh, you know, associated or with metabolism in your body, okay? Total cholesterol, I mean, not so much in terms of the impact, but it did come down. But I'm interested in triglycerides more than cholesterol and see that, 138 to 122. That's really good. That's really, really uh, something which, you know, I have no idea how we got it, but they got it. It's a six months exercise. These are some of the markers because in Zuni what we found that children are diabetic, 12 year old and 15 year old. So we wanted to look at uh, parameters for kidney disease also. Uh, one of the thing which you see here is called USCR, urine albumin creatinine ratio, which is the last column. That's the kind of a marker for early, early kidney disease. So there were kids who had higher USCR about 25. I don't worry about about 25 to 30, but if you go from 30 up, then you have some kind of kidney disease, okay? 30 to 300 is called incipient kidney disease, meaning you have early, early kind of spilling protein in your urine and all. And 300 and up is really kidney disease then. So if you look at, you know, uric acid, one of the marker for inflammation also, uh, we had some changes in that too. The thing which I didn't put it in here, which is CRP, C-reactive protein, which is a marker for inflammation and cardiovascular risk and diabetes, uh, because 
the data was all over and uh, because the lab was done by one of our tech in my lab instead of sending it to Tricor. So I have the samples, I'm going to have it try or do it again and see if we can look at those data again. Okay, so before I go to my last slide, what I want to say here is that, which I told so many people last week who came from seven different states here, we had a meeting called PCORI, Patient Center Outcome Research Institute, who came here and we took them to Zuni also. And at that time I said, you know, we worked with the kids. We got them their fat mood and got their clinical parameter really improved. But one of the things which was not part of the protocol was that we asked the school teachers whether having them participate in this help those kids in school. And we were happy to learn that many of those kids who participated with us really now are regular in their class, meaning no absentees. And on top of it, their grades improved also. And what that's what I call my reward. More than having them improve on their health, they're actually now really going through the school and improving on the, their grades, okay? So, to go to the last slide, if you do weight loss by any means you have, these are some of the things you can improve on. If you lose 10 kg, the mortality will reduce by 20% in total uh, obesity-related mortality. You'll have 30% reduction in diabetes-related death and also obesity-related cancer. If you lose 10 kg, 50% fasting glucose will come down. Your blood pressure will come down by 10 millimeter by mercury, which is systolic, and 20 millimeter by mercury diastolic. Blood lipids will also fall. Blood clotting indices, which is one of the thing, you know, clotting disorder in people who are obese, you can improve on that too. And you can reduce some of the physical complications like back and joint pain, your lung function, uh, your breathlessness, and sleep apnea. And in women, they'll improve on their ovarian function because one of the obesity-related complications in young women is, you know, uh, cystic ovary, obesity-related. So, some of these things which I do work through with the parents and ask them like what this is our most common at Zuni and in Native Americans, which of the conditions last long time, how do families cope with that, resources available to you, uh, how do you and your family eat, what is your healthy food in your opinion and what is not healthy, what role do you think diet or food have on the development of some of the disease. And so these are some of the things which we do involve the family with. And I have those data and maybe somebody will help me analyze it, you know. <laughs> uh, but this is one of the, either McDonald's or Taco Bell, we want to call, you know. But it's a Joe's place, you know, where all you can eat things we have nowadays, right? <laughs> Uh, these are my funding agencies, which I have to disclose also. Uh, I'm funded through University of New Mexico, through New Mexico INBRE, which is NIH, and also through a uh, health initiative called Community Engagement in Obesity Intervention, um, which is my ARRA funding, uh, Obama's Affordable Act. Uh, this is my Zuni MESA. Okay. Any questions? So while people are gathering their thoughts, first of all, thank you. Um, it's a very nice example of how you can make a big difference um, doing community, almost grassroots um, interventions that aren't necessarily huge or costly. Um, 
but highly effective and hopefully we'll see these be long lasting as well. So you're not only improving their physical health, but their um, mental slash behavioral health, which should have long lasting effects. And there's really no reason you couldn't translate that to other age groups, um, sure. including adults. And, and some visionaries have, have recognized this and have started health um, clubs and things in their corporations and those organizations tend to be much more successful than the the grind to the uh or the grunt to the grindstone what's it called <laughs> um so that was really great thank you. thank you so what percentage of the kids are represented by the kids that go to the to the, the exercise center so in in terms of population you know how many how many people are able to touch with this initiative and right so because of the funding, we couldn't, and the facility, what we have, we cannot accommodate more than 25 kids at a time for the program. And we wanted to follow them for six months. So it's like a batch of 25 for six months. So how many kids of that age actually are part of the Zuni? Program? A lot of them, I think. So, uh, I mean, is this 10% or 50% or... You know, right, so the, the Zuni population is, uh, as per Zuni census, is more than 11,500. Okay. Okay, and uh, the median age in Zuni is 21. Okay. Wow. So it's a young population. Okay. Okay. I mean, yes, you will see a lot of seniors and all, but it's a young population, and I, I don't have up here how many kids are in high school though. Uh, maybe one of my Zuni uh, member can help me. How many uh, Zuni high school kids are there? I think there's uh, around 400, give or take 25. Okay. So that's good. I mean, by so having 50 to 90 kids involved, you've right. got a quarter of your project. Well, my, goal, my project is funded for doing 100 kids. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. So, you know, one of the things is where we created this wellness center, uh, we used to have their local wellness center next door to us, which is now moving to downtown Zuni Arena. Uh, they have a downtown and that <laughs> uptown. <laughs> right. Sorry. So uh, uh, they have a new fancier wellness center where the community members go. These are all 638 federal programs. Okay, so they got money through them and they opened it now. It's a beautiful place. Only thing is, you know. The way we have done is like we go and grab them, meaning we bring them to our facility and then drop them home, right? Uh, I don't know whether that can happen in a community wide like that, you know, because, um, you know, there are not so many, you know, kind of organizations who can do those kind of things. We did it because this is uh, something which I wanted to prove to the governor and to IHS that having regular exercise, working with the family. Now I actually want to work with the Zuni school nurses also, and also their kitchen to see, you know, what's been fair to the kids, you know, to figure it out, whether we can address some of the issues there. Yes. Dr. Shah, we have a question from one of the participants. Uh, how many days per week did, um, did they do the exercise intervention and for how long? So three days per week minimum. That they have to do three weeks, I mean three days per week for six months. And you said it was an hour? Total hour. Uh, total time is one hour. And we bring them and drop them to their homes also. Other questions from the from the audience about um, this project or um, other things that um, Raj is doing, or things that you've done in your communities that um, may have worked similarly or not. I think they're all nibbling on the food, I guess. <laughs> My question or, or comment might be a foolish one, but 
is there any way to involve the parents so that what uh, you are teaching and working with these young people can be either reinforced or uh, uh, brought home to the to the parents to so that they can be learning what's good for them as well right and so what we do you know when I said you know we work with the family members so uh, you know we have kind of a retreat thing uh, baseline three months and six months where we bring parents also to see themselves mm -hmm. uh, to the facility and right. uh, many of the parents uh, are regular user of our exercise facility you know but they come different okay. time though okay that's, that's good because it reinforces what you're doing I would right. think with the children in school right right and one of the thing which I'm now working with the Zuni Gallup branch because we have a Zuni uh, Gallup UNM branch where the idea is that there are kids who are in college in Gallup but taking some classes in Zuni Pablo so we are going to offer them PE classes from next semester sounds very good yeah, yeah. we have another question from a participant um, was there a dietary component or was yes I forgot to mention about it uh, yes uh, that is the bigger uh, thing about dietary things and students have to kind of uh, you know face exam kind of thing also whether they understand how much he thinks so we have a dietitian from Indian Health Services Hospital uh, she works with uh, uh, dialysis center and so uh, she comes once a month and brings all those kind of exhibits okay so uh, things like you know if you look at uh, sugar in 10 ml glass one spoon and then five spoons and those kind of thing so she has those exhibits which are available for uh, school uh, teaching actually but one of the things she does is that she has then blood vessels also and say okay if you pour this much of sugar into this vessel then it will dilate and your cell thickens out and she has some really good models one of the things she also does like if you go for your eye exam and uh, you know optometrist actually put some little thing in your eye and look at glaucoma which is a pressure sensitor sensitizer so what we do is you know we have a glass of water and we put 10 gram of salt and do this pressure measurement I say okay so the water without salt this is the pressure now you put 10 gram of salt into it and the pressure is this so what does that tell you so we have very uh, interactive very good way of convincing students that those salt those fat those sugar are no good that's cool yes I borrowed that from one of the optometrists here. Oh. <laughs> But visuals with uh, yes. just simply water and an additive. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, I have a que another question. Um, we often hear from from providers that there's sometimes resistance to talking about obesity, uh, especially in in with parents about their own children and that um, oftentimes um, clinicians won't talk about it because either they're uncomfortable talking about it, they've had a bad experience talking about it with a previous family where they've been sort of shut down and, and reprimanded or um, told they were wrong. What is the um, culture in Zuni like around that discussion? Same, uh, the culture is same like what you see in other cultures which is that parent doesn't like to I mean when I had my daughter who was premature born three pounds right and I wanted her to have 10 pound weight you know <laughs> right away so we as a parent enjoy when we see our kids are eating and become healthy and heavier right and so that's our psych actually basically and so in Zuni also parents are 
not openly coming out and say, okay, can you help because my child is really heavy? That's one of the things. But we have seen over the last two years that parents sometimes call and say, please take our student for exercise because they are really heavy. And I have family history of diabetes and my grandma has, I mean, is on dialysis and all. I don't want to have my kids go through it. So in Zuni, then there is something which they can actually bring to that discussion, which is that if you keep being heavy and not do anything in terms of lifestyle, then you are going to end up having to have your blood cleaned out, you know. So that's one of the things. IHS hospital, which is only 50 yards from my facility there, um, Dr. Faber actually refers young kids who are obese to us. And we have now a referral system now. Uh, even though we don't claim Medicare uh, counseling, you know, yet. Mm -hmm. I asked the people here at UNM, and they didn't want you to go through those, uh, because then you have to have facility certified and all those things. Yeah. You know? But we do a lot of counseling like that. Um, to answer to your question, I think uh, we have to work with the family members along with the kids. And you will see resistance but you have to bang on it. That's my approach. I never give up. So. Another question from a participant. Uh, what was the most expensive portion of the program? And was it labs? <laughs> uh, so labs are now coming down cheaper to me. Um, uh, with uh, Tricor, when we used to collect the sample and send it off, um, we have a special rate called research rate. So uh, if you have to do hemoglobin A1C, it will cost me $8. Uh, then if you send it regular, which will be $75, which because that's Medicare cost. Okay, so but that way I'm lucky because uh, it's a research project right now. And so we have a research card. But I also went ahead and bought those instruments which can do point of care. So instead of drawing a blood, we can do A1C right there in five minutes or do the labs in five minutes without drawing blood. And they are clear wave, meaning uh, that's same as what you get results from your clinical lab. So it's done by a finger stick um, and the beauty is you get the results back in five minutes and while the um, individual is still there. So you can use that as part of your visit, whether it's in the clinic or in the, um, the, um, the health center facility, as part of a teaching tool or an intervention tool. Right, and we discuss about the results right there. On another topic, uh, what were the qualifications of the people teaching the exercise? So, um, I used to have two exercise trainer. Now I have only one guy uh, because of the funding. And he originally worked with wellness center, and he's certified uh, in training. So he's a P trainer actually. So somebody seems to be getting at um, how can you do this without it being hugely expensive. Right. Um, and I think that um, Raj has really figured out, I mean, you know, it costs money to start up the facility right. and buy the exercise equipment, but then there's ways to um, hone in on the costs by, um, you know, minimizing the lab tests that you're going to do. Obviously, you probably don't need all of the tests that he ran um, right. for pra for clinical practice, um, but you probably do want some of the basic ones, the A1C and maybe the lipids. Right. Um, and you and then for you know the question is, do you need somebody trained in physical education or exercise physiology to run exercise groups? And the answer is. Probably not, but probably, and the probably comes in, you know, if there were any issues of someone getting injured or hurt, um, and, and the repercussions that might come from that. 
But I think that, um, you know, having the Wii there or um, video exercise video, people do those all the time. So there's lots of ways to do it without breaking your piggy bank, so, so to speak, um, and just kind of getting started. And, you know, after a while, if things are successful, then the money might come with that, and then you can expand and grow more comprehensive. Going back to the topic, huh? I'm sorry. Going back to the topic of um, personnel, trained personnel. Would you um, open your doors to people who are personal trainers, but are willing to do, you know, um, these exercises with kids on their own time, you know, without getting paid or whatnot? Is that something that you would encourage? Right, so uh, let me give you the brief about this facility. Even though it's funded by NIH and it's UNM facility, the MOU we have with the tribal government is that the facility over a period of time will go back to tribe. And uh, they'll be the, because you know, I'm not paying any rent or anything because that was a building given to us by governor and we used uh, 100,000 funds to renovate it, put another $100,000 worth of instrument for exercise. Uh, and the idea was to open for the community, anybody, okay? So, but when we got those 200,000 funds, we told NIH that we are going to work with kids to start with. So that's why this pilot project is going on, right? Now, we have a lot of people from IHS who are coming there for exercise. We have community members even coming there for exercise. This is a wellness center for the community. Anybody can come anytime and do the exercise. Or the only thing which we don't allow is that you cannot come during the kids who are there because this is a IRB supported project, meaning those kids uh, you cannot see them as part of our program because it's against HIPAA violation. Okay, and so uh, we have fixed one hour for them. So that's the only time you cannot come. If you want to volunteer for it, then we can get you on our IRB. It takes only one day for me to get approval and you can help the kids because then I need help actually. I have a MOU with the wellness center also where mm. they can help us do Zumba classes even. They can help us do a lot of exercise. Only thing is you have to be on my IRB to do all that because it's a HIPAA violation. This is still wellness program as a research program. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. So if, if it was if it was not if there wasn't the research component, it would be easier just be based on um, you know whatever the rules of the facility are or the organization supporting the facility. But because it's research, there's an added layer of of protection um, for the research subjects. But if you have time and if you're interested, you know, talk to Philip, send me your name and uh, we'll put you on our IRB so you can help her. I work with the Zuni High School um, and the right. Zuni Middle School students as well. And that was some kind of a program that I was aiming at. And I um, consulted with the, with the um, health education teacher and he uh -huh. was more into it, but the liability that he was worried about was um, being a personal trainer. And, you know, like you said, you're only limited to 25 kids. And then I know I have several here at the high school with uh, obese problems, and we are looking towards a program that we can probably um, do, um, you know, to help these kids out, not necessarily, you know, because they're, um, I guess, 
embarrassed to go in a group setting where, yeah. you know, we want to see if these kids will be interested in, like, one-on-one to start off with and gradually engage them into a group setting. And um, I don't know, that's more of our focus that we have to help our well, middle school and the high school level. Well, I can help you there. I mean, if you have those kind of situations, because we did work with uh, the, you know, I mean, it, it was a silly thing, you know, what happened, you have kids, high school kids, kids who are incarcerated and in a detention center. So uh, three months ago, we had uh, 10 kids actually who came regularly for two months. And we used to have your Zuni police stand outside and they do exercise. But then we gave them their fixed time. And so we can work with you on those kind of things where you want to bring, let's say, five kids at a time to our facility and do this. Okay. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, the liability is the issue and that's what I covered for the, uh, you know, detention center kids. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we have an MOU with them also, governor approved it, and my people here at UNM also approved it. So if you want to do that way, we can work with school district and sign a MOU. Uh, that way, you know, any liability will be kind of dispersed with school, the tribe, the IHS, and UNM. Okay. And, and frankly, the risk of, of a problem or an injury occurring in, in the setting is, is extremely low. Um, I mean, these are pretty standard things, so it's not really an issue. I think with liability, we always make it into a bigger issue than it ever would need to be. Um, uh-huh. so, so just kind of keeping that in the back of our minds that there is really low risk and, and the benefit is, is huge. Okay. Basically, the society, you know, likes to sue each other, and that's why we worry about <laughs> liability, yeah. right? Yeah. The L word. Mm-hmm. I think that we'll um, we'll we'll pause there. I, I did anybody sign in who hasn't signed in already, or, or um, uh, let us know your name and location if you haven't done so already, please. Yes. Oh, Farina, I think I had my microphone off when I introduced myself. I'm in consulting nutrition. Can anyone hear me? I, we heard I do. A half I half of that. And this is Aldine Gomer in, in Rio Rancho. And I did want to request uh, uh, an attendance certificate if you could have that for me or email it or something. Sure will. All righty. And I do appreciate these webinars. Thank you. Hi, this Darla is Darla Likiti. Darla Likiti but... with Zuni Public School District. Hi. Uh, can uh, I... um, this is Teresa the Young, South Indian Hospital. Could you repeat that? This is Teresa Te Young, South Indian Hospital. Thank you. This is Sean Blaisdell and Sylvia Canal at Washington Middle School. Oh, hi. Hi. You're just around the corner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Sure. Um, I don't, is Suzanne still on? All right, you want to go ahead with your question? Um, the, the other person hasn't signed on yet. Okay, um, so um, Kathleen, I'm wondering about um, the off-label use of metformin in kids that um, are pre-diabetic and um, are, or I had a kid today who is diabetic but is getting treated uh, with diet. That includes one soda a day and two chocolate candies. <laughs> um, so I'm just wondering, I know that in adults there's some off-label 
use of metformin pre-diabetic. Okay, thanks. So, um, so in adults, um, we do use it in patients with prediabetes or metabolic syndrome um, and polycystic ovarian syndrome, even without having frank diabetes. Because um, we know from studies um, that um, metformin will help improve those conditions and or delay the progression to diabetes. And so the longer you can have normal glycemia, the better off we think you're gonna be as far as complications go. Um, but it has not ever been approved by the FDA for that purpose. And I don't know if that's because nobody went for an indication, because uh, it's a lot of work to go for an indication. Certainly the pharmaceutical industry didn't do it because the drug is generic and so there's no economic incentive to try to get another um, indication for a medication and people are using it off label um, because we know it works. In kids, um, it's definitely been used off label for polycystic ovarian syndrome in, in adolescent girls um, who have metabolic syndrome as well as part of their polycystic ovarian syndrome. Again, because we know that in that setting, it will improve insulin resistance. Um, it hasn't really been demonstrated in girls without polycystic ovarian syndrome to do much. Um, and there's not a lot of studies in boys who, are pre, who have prediabetes. Um, but there are some studies in, teenage, in teenagers in general with the condition who do try to behave just like adults and that it does delay the progression of the disease to overt diabetes. Um, and second of all, um, what was my second of all? Oh, well, we know that it, it does work in kids who actually have diabetes. So there's no reason to suspect that because from, insul from normal to diabetes is a spectrum and a continuum that um, you would not receive some benefit from metformin. Um, but it is off-label and it probably never will be on-label. Um, <laughs> but I think it still has a role, particularly in that kid where you see the acanthosis nigricans, the sugars are hovering in the one teens fast, <coughs> they've got low HDL, high triglycerides, maybe borderline high blood pressure, and that abdominal adiposity. Um, I, I think there's certainly a role. In girls, we've got this extra thing. <laughs> extra is not really enough of a word for it. <laughs> With the menstrual cycle and menstrual irregularities that um, we can sort of use as a benchmark um, as well. So I can't really comment more on that. We know from studies that it's beneficial. Um, and it's just not going to be on label. Regarding the, the child with diet controlled diabetes on a very interesting diet, I'm hoping that wasn't exclusively a Coke and two candy bars, <laughs> um, but that was the allowance or the um, forgiveness amount of the diet, which I think is perfectly fine. Um, you know, chances are that kid was having five Cokes and 10 candy bars or some variation thereof. So saying, you know what, you can have one a day. Um, it's probably pretty palatable to somebody versus saying you can't have any of that ever again because what's that kid going to do? He's going to have five or six a day. So he's going to go with his one. I think that that's okay because you're moving him somewhere in the right direction. Um, you know, it's fine if you're keeping his blood sugars, if his blood sugars are being maintained under good control with physical activity, diet, lifestyle changes. Um, I, I think that's more than appropriate. And the, the reward is, one, you get to stay off of medications um, and good job. And two, um, you know, sometimes this progresses uh, despite our best efforts and this medication's always here if we need it. And so if it was a reluctance on the, on, the, on the side of the parents to put their child on a medication, you can use that sort of as a, well, let's see how this goes for three months, but let's not take it off the table. We'll have it there in case we need it, as you sort of nudge them along into acceptance. And I'm happy to open that up to discussion for um, anybody who has had any other experiences.
And do you have other thoughts on that, Suzanne, or experiences? This is Carol in Santa Fe. I just want to agree with what you said because if you if you don't start where the client is, you're not going to get anywhere. So you have to if they're drinking ten sodas, then you know moving them down to five is even an improvement. Um, so this is Suzanne, and I don't know how many sodas uh, this student was drinking before. That's where she's at now. And we did negotiate um, to cut back to one piece of candy a day. She's going to have an apple instead, and she's going to come see me in about a week. Um, her medical care is being managed at the IHS Canyoncito Clinic. Um, I just saw her for a sports physical today and um, talked to her a bit. So I... I don't know what her hemoglobin A1C is. I doubt they offered metformin. I just thought, well, I wonder, you know, if people are starting to um, use it in that in that fashion. So, thank you. You're welcome. You know, uh, one other thing which I would like to tell you guys that yes, it's okay to work with kids, you know, with pharmacological agents as long as you monitor them. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the kids are kids. And, you know, the major thing in diabetes is hypoglycemia. I mean, with metformin, you don't worry about it so much. But still, if you monitor it, you know, I don't see any problem there. And, and also, never let the lifestyle go to the sideline. Side right. It's always got to be front, front and foremost um, in your ongoing discussions, um, even if you... Even if they end up on medication, it's it's still got to be there. And and again, if they were on uh, six sodas a day and you put them on metformin and now they're on four, work with them to get down to two. Even though the metformin's working, um, you still have a lot of leeway as far as their uh, physical activity and lifestyle. So never let them get away with thinking that the medication's going to do the job. And same way for the drinks also. You know, never offer diet drinks because diet drinks are more causal in diabetes than the real drinks so uh, don't try to kind of suffer from one to another the um the guideline people <laughs> they're just going to lump them into one category um, there have just been a new set of recommendations that came down from ADA. Was it the ADA yeah. around obesity and obesity um, discussion? And um, what I got out of it was the recommendation is that um, clinicians and and members of the healthcare team need to be much more aggressive in one um, diagnosing obesity because it's now considered a diagnostic. It's got its ICD-9 code, so it's considered a disease. So much more aggressive in diagnosing it, i.e. measuring the BMI or whatever um, parameter you use, and, talking and, about it. and much more aggressive about talking about it, not the go lose weight, because we know that in the past 30 years that hasn't worked, um, but individualizing um ways to do that. Uh, you can now bill for obesity counseling if you have, um, they've actually removed it from the people who do it best, which is the uh, dietitians. Um, but now the provider, or if you have a dietitian on your team, they can bill for it in that setting. So, um, you know, they're not hard and fast guidelines um, that are going to remarkably change things unless they change the way that we in clinical practice think about it and respond to it. Uh, and that was in a... And that was in a... And that was in a... Thank you. So in, in, in children, you know, there's another layer of the parents um, that we've got to sift through so that's a little bit harder, but that's going to come down the pipeline too. Um, and again, it really reflects the tobacco campaign that we went through in the 70s and 80s. Um, the study showed that only 30% of people who were obese felt like their doctor or their clinician actually talked to them about obesity or even brought it up. 
Um, so that's pretty low and you can't really do anything about it from a health perspective unless you talk about it. Um, and that's really how the tobacco campaign started as well. So, um, you know, it's a start in the right direction. Um, but definitely the lifestyle was at the core of that discussion as well. This, this anyone... is Suzanne again. I, I also wanted to just speak to, um, there's, you know, the obesity epidemic is multifaceted. It's uh, cultural, it's related to socioeconomics, it's related to rural, urban, um, family. And um, I think people get frustrated and they think, well, why, why aren't we, why just focus on exercise with kids and, you know, then they go home and, you know, they have their whole family thing, but you have to start somewhere. And sometimes that's what you can affect. You know, it'd be great um, to be able to change what uh, stores provide, what's available in rural areas, but I think more specifically we can affect um, physical activity, um, sometimes more than, obviously more than nutrition. So there, I'll get off my soapbox. No, no, that's an excellent point. So, um, you know, choose the path of least resistance and start with that and, and the other things will come along. Um, and, you know, in another community, it might be something else. Um, but I think kind of go where, where, you, where you can make an impact. That's a great point. Any other comments, questions, questions about patients or patient care or top ideas for topics for future um, COMTC sessions? We're more than willing to hear those now or you can send emails or whatever you choose. And uh, we'll try to hook up with Roswell next time. The next session is scheduled for December the 6th. Um, and that will be the last Hi. Bye until after the, um, um, until after the holiday. So we hope to see you on December 6th. Oh. Now talk, Dr. Bennett. Go ahead. Go ahead. Did someone just join us? Yeah. Can you, it's it's Karen, Dr. Vine in Roswell with our case. Oh. Um. Okay. We have we only have five minutes left. Is that going to work? Well, we'll try. Jenny Vickers is here. I thought you. We were waiting for you guys to finish, and uh, uh, so that we could present this case. Okay. 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 We're gonna talk about here. Can can I do it quickly? Yeah, yeah. It's a little. Yeah, yeah. yeah? Okay. Now, uh, how's how's Josiah? It's a twelve-year-old male. Did you get the stuff, Kathleen? I, all I got was one clinic note. Oh. Well. And you didn't get any labs? No. That. That was um, that was the one I sent to you twice. So the clinic note I got twice, and that was it. Okay. Uh, well, you, you know Jenny Vickers. Yeah. Okay, she's here too. Well, uh, uh, so our essentially, uh, this is a twelve-year-old male who has a seizure disorder. For how long? It's been what since he's been.